uh, meeting of uh, January the 4th, 2023, the district board meet, board of the MDC come to order, please. Clerk, please read. Oh, it's not. Debella here. Adel here. Avedesian here. Pisano here. Mule here. Bush here. Curry here. Desai here. Drake here. Gale Gardo here. Gentile Healy. Hoffman, here. Hoheb, Holloway, here. Lachance, Lester, here. Lewis, here. Magnin, Maniscalco, Mandike, here. Payne, here. Patel, here. Potoski, Salemi. I see Commissioner Salemi's on the WebEx. Torres. Here. Wolf. Here. Carrier. We have a quorum. Okay. Please stand for the Please stand for the pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty. Item number four, uh, approval of the minutes of the December 5th, uh, 2022 meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion, uh, additions or deletions? Yes, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, this is Commissioner, Commissioner Mandike. Mandike. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, at the last meeting, there was a resolution put forth to increase the amount of um, for the Metro Hartford Alliance for our membership. I abstained during that vote. I received a call from the chairman after that. He requested in an effort of transparency that I speak this evening to tell people why I abstained from that vote so it could be on the record. So just to let everyone know, David Griggs is on my board. I am the executive director of the IQUIL partnership. So I just wanted to make sure I clarified that and let everybody know in the interest of transparency that I told everybody that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, further changes, changes or additions or deletions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Item five, public comments relative to agenda items. Items, uh, okay, uh, before we, we have an, an amendment or a, an add-on to the agenda without objection to refer item number nine, vacancies on committees of technology to the committee on organization. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? This is, has to go back to the Board of Organization. We're going to recess uh, and they can introduce it and then take action on it. It shouldn't be more than five to ten minutes. Before you do that, you have to entertain a motion to add another member to the Technology Committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, included in there, in addition to that, it would be to add an additional member for a vacancy on the board of uh, the committee, I'm sorry, the committee on. It's not vacancy. It's a new member. A new member, but there's, the issue is. The other one's a vacancy. Vacancy. One's a vacancy, one's a new member. Um, so this would be for the vacancy or for the new no, member? You're going to refer the vacancy to organization. Right. Together with a. If, if it member. passes a resolution for a new member, not a vacancy, but a new member, the assignment of which will be considered by the organization committee as well. Once they do their, their job after reconvening, they'll adjourn, come back. You'll, you'll reconvene and, and consider both items, however they got there, but both items, 
the uh, replacement or the, uh, the filling of the vacancy caused by the passing of, Mr. of Commissioner Vecino and the assignment of a new member to the new uh, position on the Technology Committee. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, you, you can just add that on to my motion to refer. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Opposed? None. Okay. And then we need a, a motion. Motion to, to recess, recess uh, for the uh, Committee on Organization to consider the vacancies. So moved. Second. We moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? You go right from there. <laughs> we stand uh, adjourned. You want to? He's going to. He's going to. No, no, no. This is okay. open session, so you can. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Avery Buell. I'm uh, chairman of the uh, uh, committee and organization, and um, I'd like to reconvene um, and um, continue a recommendation in this case for the committee of technology, committee on technology to uh, fill a vacancy with Commissioner Adel and a new position with Commissioner Gardo. Um, is, is there a motion? Is there a motion? Is there a motion? So moved. Oh, I'm sorry. You're chairing Second. this meeting. I'm not chairing this meeting. Second. 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 Um, any questions? We'll take a favor. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Pass. Thank you. And um, uh, motion to. Um, Do you have anything else on your agenda besides that? Uh, no. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I, I, number five, the opportunity for general public comments. Isn't there? Or none, I see. Uh, number six, uh, are there any commissioner comments and questions? We have to do the other piece of it. Commissioner, commissioner Bush? Yeah, what is the, uh, what was the criteria to determine the number of uh, members of the technology committee? I'm not aware of the, um, the number since it's a, uh, it's a new committee that was formulated, formed by the uh, board. So I might defer to the chairman? Yeah, uh, the reason is we've tried to keep this a small committee because there's getting a, a quorum, even though there's three, getting a quorum has generally been a problem with committees. But more importantly, we're dealing with an issue that we think there should be a smaller committee than a larger committee. Well, you're, you're adding someone, though. I know we are, but that would be to the, the six. We had talked about that before, going to six. There was going to be an additional. But we're going to seven, though. Why are we adding a member? Uh, the addition, I believe, was, uh, like I said, we talked about going to seven for an, an odd number. Um, does, the, do, does the quorum, is the quorum dictated by the number of members? No, it's dictated by the formation of the committee. The committee so voted for a quorum of three. For a quorum three of members. three. So it wouldn't matter how many commissioners were on the committee, the quorum would still be three. Right. But a working committee of, of 10 or 12 is a, the reason we referred the issue from public works to a smaller committee. Okay. Okay. Further discussion? Um, I have before I, um, I have one other quick comment uh, with regard to what I mentioned before, um, and that was for those who weren't here, um, my intention is to contact all the commissioners uh, next fall um, and inquire about uh, the committees that you know, you're serving on or the committees you might want to serve on and so forth and so on, uh, just to take advantage of people's desires, uh, their expertise, and so forth. I meant to add to that that I'm also going to pay attention to the representation um, of towns on various committees. So, for example, you know, uh, BPW isn't just three towns or something like that. So I'll be paying attention to that also. Are there any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Commissioner, yeah, yeah, Commissioner Payne. Chairman, um, thank you. This is Commissioner Payne. Will um, will there be an opportunity for uh, other towns to have um, citizen members? That's the legislature's decision. That's a good question. I don't have an answer. Isn't that the you mean on the Board of Finance, Tony? Just in general, 
I just, I've never had anybody come to Newington and say, hey, do you have any citizens that would like to be on? Well, in order to be on, on most boards at the MDC, you have to be a commissioner. Yep. Um, if there, to the extent there are vacancies on the commission, then uh, certainly that can be made public. And uh, if there's an expression of interest from any community, they can make that known to mm -hmm. Commissioner Buell in, his, in the organization committee as a whole as to uh, that issue. Um, his work is mostly done um, after they're appointed, uh, but if you want to express some interest, you can do it through that committee. I'm sure he'll share that information with uh, the full board as well. I, but a question I might have, Commissioner Payne, is if we are, I think it's bylaws, we are 29 commissioners. So if we did have another legislative or governor, govern, governor appointed commissioner, then um, I guess a town well, or whatever. Well, we, 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 we have, I'm sorry, we, we have a couple of things going on here. So we have uh, Chris Stone District Council. We have 29 voting commissioners, four non-voting commissioners, from the, and those four are from the non-member towns. To the extent there's a vacancy in commissionerships, that uh, so say we only have 27 filled and there's two outstanding, those are who is placed on the commission is up to the appointing authority for that particular position, whether it's a legislative appointment, appointment a gubernatorial appointment, or a town appointment. This, this commission has very little, if anything, to, and, and by, by charter has very little to right, do with, with that. Okay. Once appointed, and then the assignment comes up uh, as to, uh, obviously, one of the things that the committee and organization would look to is, is the preference of the, the new member. Uh, the second would be obviously the needs of the commission uh, of the commission or the subcommittees to have members placed uh, uh, on those committees, and any other you know items that the organization committee th in in the chair have um, considered to be important expertise. You mentioned it, Commissioner Buell, the particular expertise of the commissioner. But that's when you, you can can then offer if you have uh, someone from Newington or someone from Windsor that you know that could be. I know that there were there are individuals who's uh, outside of Weathersfield that uh, wrote in, in support of uh, Commissioner Gardeau for the Technology Committee based upon his expertise and his interest in serving. That can be done, and it would be done through uh, the Chairman Buell and then brought to the Organization Committee. Thank you. Uh, just just let me add on to that. There's been some evolution relative to appointees and where they came from. Originally, the district board was formed in 1929 in our charter. That stated, I think it was 12, Chris was 12. I wasn't here. <laughs> I wasn't either, but I was You may have been close. here. You may have been here. No, no. But what, what happened was there were some changes, and they were all gubernatorial appointments. And then I believe it was in the 1980s, uh, the legislature, with it in its wisdom, determined to change the governor's appointees and add to them. And what they did is they reduced the governors to nine, and they increased the number of towns to 16, I believe it was. It brought it to uh, 27, no, 26. And at 26, it must have been 17. And, and then in uh, 1993, I think I did it, 94, we amended it in the legislature to add four additional appointments that were the appointees of the legislature. Two from the minority, two from the majority. So that meant in the majority, it would be an appointment by a president pro tem of the Senate, one, a president appointment of the, um, of, uh, the Speaker of the House's appointment, and then the two minority appointments, the minority leader of the House and the minority leader of the Senate. That's four. The other change that was made up until about uh, 1990, 1970, uh, I'm sorry, 1978 or 80 it was, they changed the, the appointments to people that either passed away or resigned from the district for any reason when there was a vacancy. It was always appointed, filled by the Metropolitan District Commission. They changed it that it would be filled by the propo proposing or if the legislature made the appointment and it happened there, it, they would make the uh, replacement. If it was in a town, the town would make the replacement. And if it was the governor, the governor would make a replacement. That's basically been the, uh, the term of change that we've had in evolution in that specific point. 
Now, the question of citizen members, I believe, is also a charter issue, is it not? Well, it's a charter issue. Yeah. We do have board of appointees. Uh, yep. Members who are citizens, not commissioners. In fact, the majority of the board of appointees membership is comprised of citizen members of the board of appointees. And I think on uh, if you look at uh, strategic planning, there's yes, some there's one. Well, I think, so yeah. That, that's the extent of non-commissioner serving on board. And then the last change was uh, the issue of non-voting non-member towns. That was done, what, about 12, 10 years ago, 12 years ago? 2014, I believe. 2014, okay, oh, nine years ago. It, it was done, and that added, uh, five, what's it, four or five? <coughs> four. That added uh, East Granby, um, Farmington, South Glastonbury, South and South Windsor. So that, that's the evolution of what's happened by virtue of changing our charter by either the legislature or by the legislature. Okay. So, uh, are there any further comments from commissioners? And I would move to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Super. We're adjourned. Okay. Thanks. Would the board please come to session um, after the recess? So we're now in the, in the district board uh, meeting. And before us, um, let's see, do we have to take up that issue now? Or <coughs> um, uh, no, add no, to agenda. No, the warrants. Move to the reports. Okay. Uh, item six, a report from the district chairman. Um, just the issue of the meeting that we had up in um, uh, New Hampshire, which was, what's a, um, the association uh, that put it Nebra. on? NEBRA. NEBRA was supposedly uh, a meeting that talked about digesters, uh, had some discussion of uh, the question of PFAS. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know what you want to say, it basically turned into a question of totally PFAS because it was just one constant issue uh, with the federal government changing. The EPA had changed the uh, issue of PFAS in terms of um, from 10 part, was it 10 parts per, trillion. 10 pa parts per trillion uh, to under two parts per trillion. Uh, the significant issue was that Scott has res responded to, we had either placed it uh, sludge on land, in a landfill, or it was incinerated. Um, based on what EPA is, was stating, they were, the states, two of the major states in New England, outlawed it being placed on the land because of PFAS, obviously, in the sludge would penetrate and go into the aquifers and consequently created a problem. So that meeting, for all intents and purposes, went from issues on digesters to basically PFAST, and it was a day and a half of uh, continual issues on PFAST uh, because it had been accelerated significantly, especially I believe it was in Maine and in, uh, New Hampshire, where we were having the affair because these people were looking at what do we do with it, um, you know, and that was the main issue that we had at that, um, that meeting. Uh, at 2 o'clock, I think it was, or 2.30, they had invited uh, two, was it two or three contractors in uh, that did thir certain things with PFAS and had procedures. I was not there for that. We had a board meeting um, that was at 5.30, and I had to drive back from New Hampshire to Hartford and uh, make it by 5.30, so I didn't, I wasn't in attendance for the 2 o'clock. It was supposed to, it was supposed to cease at 1.30, but they kept it going till 2 to about 4 o'clock on presentations that they made. I was not there for that meeting. But the significance was the meeting was PFAS. PFAS was the center fold of, of what, what do you do and how do you do it, and basically no one had an answer because no one knew what EPA was going to do, but they knew there was a problem with the disposal of what you could do by either state DEEPs or uh, EPA. 
uh, in terms of what was going to happen. That's any questions? I'll be glad to answer. Yeah. No, Mr. Chairman, um, have you had any communication with CTEC? Um, I'm wondering why they um, continue to advertise that they're doing a pilot program with us, and so I'm wondering whether or not you had any communications with the I CEO have had, or anybody else at the company. I have had several communications with them relative to their technology. No communications to them relative to any issue that they would be eligible or that we were dis we were doing anything on a pilot program. That's they've gone to several t communities, Farmington. They've gone to um, Middletown pursuing the issue of, a, of a, um, a pilot program. It's not just the MDC. They've been to, like I know of two of them, are Farmington and uh, Scott's got designation of, of uh, Middletown. It's just I find it pretty abnormal that uh, we, we catch them a second time advertising that it's they're doing the a pilot. It's not the second time they've advertised. That was the issue of biotech. Biodiesel. No, it was CTAC. This is the second time. Well, I can't control that. So, well, what, what's the issue? You, did you did you encourage them? Uh, did you you must have given them some sort of idea or uh, I mean they, something must have. They so, they no, a, a company doesn't do that. Excuse just me. Out of could, the I, blue. could I? If I could finish first. Uh, go ahead. It's it's abnormal for a company to to advertise that they're doing that unless somebody gave them the impression that it was okay. They said that to us when we had the meeting in May, that they'd be willing, that the, their technology, they'd be willing to do a, do a uh, pilot program for, what was it, 30 to 60 days or 90 days or whatever it was. So it, that started back in May of 2021 when we, when we initially met with them. They've submitted to me significant amounts of information. That's my prerogative to deal with them on information. No, no suggestion that we were willing to do anything with them on, on a, a pilot at all. And I don't think any other town has, has agreed to do it. Okay, uh, one more question, Mr. Chairman, through you to the District Council. District Council, is this the second time that we've had to notify CTEC that they were overstepping their bounds on gasification, uh, announcing that we were doing a 90-day pilot program? Um, well, it's the second time we put them on notice to to. The, the, I got to be clear here, though. It, it was clear. Clear it up. Go ahead. It wasn't about um, starting a 90-day program. That their language was hopefully start, but the more concerning language that, uh, and I alerted them to this particular phrase within two um, communications uh, to. Uh, one to a uh, potential end user, another water pollution control authority, and the other to um, regulatory agencies that are looking into, actively looking into new technologies um, in, in, in gasification in particular, but also other technologies. And that was the, the phrase, and, I'm, and I, I apologize if I, um, I have to paraphrase it, but was the following. We are working closely with the Metropolitan District through its chairman and his team. That's the language that, that troubles me um, because I ap approached the chairman and he indicated that, that that's not the case. So, I, and I take him at his word. I put them on notice once. It didn't seem to do anything. I put them on notice twice. I don't think this, you know, three strikes and, you know, we're going to be forced because, again, we don't know who sees those types of communications. What we do know is that it's an, it's an emerging industry, these new technologies, that they're competitors, that uh, one of the instances in which the statement was made was, at a, was also at a conference uh, verbally, but in the writing I have two, two instances. And, and so I I'm going to assume that uh, if it's in the public arena that it's permeated throughout the public arena. Um, for purposes of me representing the MDC uh, Commission. And so uh, my concern was sending that message and doing one of potentially, and I shared this with the chairman, potentially one of two things, querying the, the potential pool of competitors with the district for um, potentially, and you haven't decided this yet, we're a long way from there, but potentially 
providing uh, some sort of service uh, or, or technology to the MDC. Uh, if, if a competitor knows or feels that, that there's already an in for, for someone like C, or any company, let alone C, any company, they would probably dissuade them from investing what it could be several hundred thousand dollars in a, in a response to an RFQ, RFP, uh, than not. So that was the first concern. The second concern was if whether it's CTEC or ABC Corporation uh, doing the same thing has a technology that is uh, quite effective and state of the art and something we would want to take advantage of, we, would, we wouldn't want that company to be disqualified from participating and, and, and have our 400,000 customers, 110,000 accounts, not be able to take advantage of that technology because the bidding process, the procurement process was biased, skewed, and leaned towards one com uh, particular competitor. So those are my concerns. It has nothing to do with, with C-Tech, that technology, that's way above, over my head. It has to do with the representations of working closely with the Metropolitan District through its chairman and his team. And we had- Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner Patel. I also stated, and I think correctly, our council notified them. Short of that, if somebody makes a false statement, you cannot do much about it. And those who follow that or believe them, and if they do something uh, without checking with us, then that's their fault. You cannot just control all over whoever makes all kinds of false statements. So I think council correctly notified them. And short of going to court or all that, I'm not sure whether it is worth going in a court and fighting. Thank you. Uh, just to clear the issue up, we're going to take that up on Friday. Chris and um, actually Joan uh, Gentile has made a proposal uh, to us, and Chris and the staff are crystallizing it. Chris, you want to? Just, yeah. just briefly, so that we straighten this out going forward. Chris Stone, District Council. I'm, I'm, and I encourage all whoever can attend, either in person or remotely, uh, do so. But it's going to be uh, what, what it hopes to be a, a, a various um, substantive meeting of the Technology Committee on Friday. We'll, we'll, we'll present a proposal to develop a, what's called an RFI, a request for information process, that is not targeted to one technology or one company, but to the the, I'll call it the technology public in, in kind of general, stuff. where they have an opportunity. And it's a very wide um, uh, distribution or circulation where they would have an opportunity, and everyone would have an opportunity to respond, provide us information about their technology, understanding that there's not, that doesn't involve a commitment from the MDC to a contract, doesn't involve the commitment to the MDC to even uh, engage in that particular technology, but it allows us or the, that committee to take a broad uh, uh, approach to seeing what's out there. Now, I would I say that with the with, and, and I've indicated to Commissioner Gentile about this, uh, and, and she was the one she initiated this whole process. You know, there are th a couple things that have to happen first, right? We have technology now that um, uh, down at the South Meadows for I just used the uh, the uh, the smokestacks down at the uh, down in the South Meadows as by of example by way of example. That were the subject of the white paper that Scott prepared, and that uh, all indications are that they're effective. That they've been able to meet the EPA standards that went from 3,800 parts per million, I believe, on carbon down to 50 parts per million on carbon. So they've been uh, it's been effective, and they're they're an investment. And I think the first issue may is should be a consideration of whether to go forward with other technologies to replace that or not, and that's a decision that the technology committee and then ultimately the board is going to have to make. Um, but the other uh, uh, part of it is to to have a general enough general enough solicitation, if that were the, the choice of the technology committee, that you're not targeting or gearing towards any particular technology, <coughs> but rather getting a sense of what else, what all of the what's out there. So, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Torres. Torres. Yeah, uh, I, I'm concerned that this process. Um, because of our past history with a lot of contractors that blindside us many times, they tell us one thing and then they come out and they do something else, that this potential procurement process, at the very least, 
is tainted and at the worst is poisoned. Um, and I think that, uh, I, and I, I agreed with the last uh, uh, letter that you sent these folks, uh, but I think they, there has to be a drop dead date and a um, retraction from these people acknowledging the fact that there is no pilot uh, and that, uh, uh, that, it's, that it's in writing because I think it couldn't do us a lot of harm down the road as we go into a procurement process for the very reasons that you just stated. And it's a tremendous disservice to our constituents, the, the, the towns, that, that we do not have the, then the potential to have the best possible competitive process because we have to eliminate one potential entity that could be a very good entity. And because they're playing these games, you know, and I don't know if they understand the repercussions you know, of, of what they're doing, uh, as we do. Uh, maybe they don't understand government procurement processes, uh, but, you know, this is a very serious matter that leaves us open to all kinds of liability issues down the road. So I would recommend that we have a drop dead date, ask them in writing to clarify the fact that there is no such thing as a pilot program envisioned, okay, and that their communications have been solely for the purpose of infor te uh, technological information. Period. Well, I, I think we're going to do it in a general manner so that we avoid any back and forth with any contractor, because we don't have any any relationship with them other than they were soliciting information. I think that's what Chris is trying to do, a request for information, so I, that no one can say that we're doing anything for anybody else. Well, I, I understand that, but the issue is that, as uh, Corporation Council has stated, uh, this is in the public domain. This information is out there, so anybody out there uh, has access to this understanding that they already have an in with the MDC, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. right. Well, we're going to make that clear at the meeting on, Mon on Wednesday that why we're doing this. I'm sorry, on Friday. And, and that, if I might, Mr. Chairman, yeah. And, and that has uh, the Friday has a lot to do with with uh, a more positive way of moving forward. Right on these type of types of issues. But uh, to your point, uh, Commissioner Torres, and absent any, any ob objection, I will, uh, we, we, we walked the, up to the line on that last letter we sent out and we gave them the warning similar to what I'm, I'm alluding to this evening, uh, but we can take that next step and since, you know, if it happens again, then uh, there will be a, a certain a consequence, but, and hopefully it won't happen again. I, it's, this is not about, you know, you know, Punishment, but there's about consequences, right? So, uh, if if it if it were to happen again, then uh, and I'll spell out the consequence. I'll make sure all of you get a copy of, of that letter. Uh, but it's very difficult, as you you just alluded to, Commissioner. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to unring the bell, right? The, the information's out there. So all we the best we can do is is a, a, another firm warning with the consequence, and and ask for the uh, retraction sent to us. So if we get a question, then it was uh, from somebody. Are you or aren't you? We can point to that retraction as as clear indication that we're not. Further discussion. <clears throat> okay. Um, what do we have? A motion. Nothing before us. Okay. We can we we can proceed. No, don't we have to take action on? Uh, we're on your point? report. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, item seven. Report from the chief executive officer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got three quick items, and it will be quick. Um, as, as you know, uh, and I appreciated your patience last month in presenting the, the management study uh, last uh, December 5th, I think was our meeting. Uh, we've uh, made a commitment to bring um, a number, uh, six uh, presentations specific to each individual department. We're planning, we're trying to make this schedule uh, work with our uh, uh, our, our chair of strategic planning, Commissioner Avedesian, and um, staff is going to be working uh, within the next couple of weeks to try and schedule that next <coughs> meeting, which we'll, we're going to start with operations. We'll follow the, uh, the, the format of the summary, um, and we'll focus on operations and what we've done with operations. So we'll be working with the Chairman Avedesian on that uh, scheduling of that event uh, or meeting. It'll be a public meeting. 
uh, we're hopeful to have a West Hartford uh, 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 public television here as well so we, we can uh, reach a broader audience for these, these events and we'll be scheduling that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm not going to get into too, too, too much detail <clears throat> on our DPH uh, 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 hearing tomorrow. I do want to mention, though, that we did meet on December 8th with our watershed towns, uh, Bar Campstead, Colebrook, and New Hartford and Heartland, and just to uh, get their support and understanding of what we're trying to do here. Uh, they've been very supportive of us, and, um, and they're very uh, hopeful that we are success successful in, in, our, uh, in our hearing uh, tomorrow. Um, the last item is, uh, some of you may remember this, uh, 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 commissioners from Windsor may remember this, but um, one signed the night in July of 2013, I got a phone call from um, our staff and uh, uh, Susan Negrelli and, and uh, Rob Langenhauer and had indicated we're having a severe uh, loss of water at, a, at our treatment plant in West Hartford. And, um, and Bloomfield, and we were really trying to figure out what was going on. It was, it was 10 o'clock at night. Uh, usually when they have a major water main break, when you're losing two to five million gallons of water, um, this, uh, some, someone calls, you know, police, fire, someone makes a phone call and says, we got a big water main break somewhere. With more than an hour of no phone calls, my immediate reaction was the river. There's a crossing. Uh, water crossing that we can't see. Uh, and it happened to be Palisado um, uh, 159 over the bridge there in Windsor. And sure enough, a, um, uh, a, our 20-inch uh, main had blown in the river. And uh, the important part of this is we have water crossings um, that are, 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 are um, Achilles' heel. Right, so we have a water crossing, a North Main um, transmission main that crosses over um, the dike system in, in the northern part of Hartford. We have a water main that crosses on the south part by the old trash plant across the river to, to uh, East Hartford. And um, these pipes are the same vintage as the pipe that blew in um, uh, the, over the bridge at 159. We immediately fixed that. Um, but we, we knew that there was a strategic issue of getting a new water main across the Connecticut River for uh, purposes of being able to replace the existing ones that are there. Again, same vintage, late 60s cast iron pipe. We are very successful and we've been notified and I want to thank uh, Chris Levesque and, and Dave Banker and Sue Negrelli and uh, Chris Stone and, and Steve Bonafonte. We've been notified, we've received a two and a half million dollar grant for that water main um, and we're, we've uh, been planning for that and hoping for that grant uh, which is going to be successful. It's a, roughly a 25 million dollar project and but it's going to allow us to uh, not rely on, remember, we got two pipes serving the east part of the river, and they're both the same age. It's like re replacing the light bulb at the same time. What do you expect? The light bulbs go off at the same time. So this is very important for us. We'll be working diligently to execute that project uh, once we get the, that grant money in place. So, Okay, Scott, just going back to the first issue with strategic planning, um, you're also going to contact our towns uh, and make them aware of what we're doing on the on the study. Yes, and yes, we will. We're, we're going to be a substantial amount of information, and it should be definitive to them as well because they're the paying paying the bill here. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, and we're going to try and keep these meetings uh, down to an hour and a half, within half hours of questions. It's a lot of information. We don't want to have to repeat it. So that's why we want to have, we want to invite our towns. We also want to have them publicized with uh, West Hartford TV so that we can reach as many uh, people as possible. But yes, we will be inviting our towns. Are we to going to have a web uh, access to that? We, we always do. We're, we'll have that's we'll a public, have a, a public, web, public meeting. So public we'll meeting, it's, uh, yeah. we'll have web, app, web um, access. Yes, web access. Okay. Yep. Are there questions? That's it.
That's the end of the report. Are there, are there questions to Scott's report? Okay. Uh, let's see. Don't forget me again. Uh, uh, number eight, report from the district council. I wouldn't forget the district Thanks. council. Uh, Chris Stone, District Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two things. Uh, you received an, e an email from me uh, just before the holidays, I believe, just before Christmas, uh, regarding the Marriott uh, assessment appeal. As you recall, uh, we were successful at the appellate court level on that appeal um, in the time frame for, by which the other side had to appeal that ruling uh, lapse in mid-November. Um, we got an email just before the holiday, or the, the, the lawyer representing us uh, got an email just before the holiday indicating that the notice from the court about the, uh, on the ruling had gone into his spam filter of his uh, email. He never got notice. Um, he has since filed a, uh, a, what's called a late filed, or petition for late filing of a petition for certification to the Supreme Court of Connecticut to uh, review or <coughs> reconsider our appeal. We've objected to that. Um, who knows where it's going to go? That's one of the problems with technologies is that you run into these problems. And, and uh, both myself and, and my brother counsel on this understand that these things happen. And it's, we don't think it's, it's, um, uh, it's anything nefarious on, on, on our opposing counsel's part. But there are ways, the things that you can do and that our council does to avoid these types of things, uh, including getting direct notices from the court that something has happened in the case, even if you don't know what is happening, but you get a, a ping, so to speak, as to what's happening, just so you're, you keep an eye on these things. So who knows what's going to happen. I'll certainly report back to all, to all of you once the, uh, the Supreme Court rules on, on that motion for a late filing. And then the second thing is the uh, tunnel uh, litigation uh, that's pending in federal court. That has been uh, by order of the uh, federal judge Arterton has been ordered uh, to uh, me mediation through a, an assigned magistrate. We have a scheduling conference next uh, Tuesday on that. Uh, so that's a, a an effort by the uh, federal court to short circuit what could be a very long, expensive, discovery laden, pleading laden uh, litigation that uh, probably is going to make more money for lawyers than anybody would uh, want to imagine. So um, it's, it's an effort for early intervention by the court, a specifically assigned magistrate uh, who will accommodate our schedule, but also move this along so that if there's any hope including uh, or outside the what's already going on in terms of negotiation between Scott and his staff on the technical side. But if there's any hope to, to try to get some resolution on that uh, very significant case, it's now uh, because as all of you can imagine, once you, you get into the trenches of litigation, you fall in love with your case and nobody wants to settle because they've invested too much um, and, and, and are, are reluctant to uh, resolve it short of uh, uh, going to the courthouse steps on trial day and, and, and understanding that your case maybe isn't as good as you thought it was on either side. And it's certainly not here because we know we have a great case. But um, <laughs> that's where that is. But it's an, it's an important step in terms of, of how that case is proceeding. I, I'm, I'm thankful to Judge Arterton and, and uh, in her assignment of, of a magistrate specifically for us. And, and the difference in, in uh, Commissioner Gale and others uh, uh, can attest to this, the difference between obviously federal court is then state. The state will give you a pretrial, and, and unless it goes to complex litigation, it's basically a pretrial or two, and you try to resolve a multi-million dollar case in about an hour. Here we've got, uh, and that's just because of the resources aren't there, not because of an unwillingness, but the resources aren't there. The other option would have been private mediation, which is uh, costly. It's uh, you pay a, a couple thousand dollars a day, and it could go on for days and days and days. And um, uh, you, you don't you, you get sometimes a retired judge, sometimes you get a you, you choose a, a, a lawyer in the construction industry, but you have to agree on the person. Uh, here we didn't have any say; uh, it was the magistrate that was assigned to us, and that's fine. Um, but it's it's. The only th expense you pay is for the lawyer, but it's a lawyer in mediation rather than a lawyer in litigation. So it's much more, much less expensive than otherwise. So Correct. that's proceeding, and I'll keep you posted on how that progresses uh, as that moves uh, forward. Chris, I got one question on on this issue. This is a mediation, though it's not an art. It's not a binding. It would be a mediation, even though it's a federal 
appointed that, attorney. It's it it wouldn't be binding. That, what that, what would happen is you'd come to a mediation, and then you'd have to have a binding. How do, how do you bind that? Well, you you, you agree to it. So it's it's okay. the judge, the, the court, the magistrate, uh, and and then ultimately the federal judge can't compel you to settle a case in mediation. Right. They can c control you. They can try to convince you. They can move you towards closer perhaps, but they can't make you. Uh, that's mediation. Binding arbitration is different. That is you throw on your case. It's an abbreviated process, not quite a trial, but basically the, the arbitrators get everything. They decide you're, you're bound by it. There's very limited appeal rights. You have to prove the arbitrator was a, was a crook, committed fraud, misapplied the law, or issued a ruling that was against public policy. Those are the four bases for, uh, for an appeal of a binding arbitration award. Um, so th this is that, that process as the chairman described. Um, we, just by way of example, and I'll this, then I'll be quiet, but we went through mediation and resolved the case on the Ludlow uh, Limbrook um, uh, sewer collapse, the liner collapse in West Hartford. That was heading towards, you know, just more and more litigation and, and um, more than it had to be, particularly where you have an issue where we, we, there was one party that we knew was not at fault in that liner collapse, and that was the NDC. There were three other parties, three defendants, fighting, you know, pointing their fingers at each other. So you can imagine uh, how, how that was working out. But we were able to get uh, close to 100 cents on the dollar uh, through mediation to the work of uh, the, the, the magistrate that, that heard that case, federal magistrate. And, and, you know, hopefully this will have bear the same fruit, but um, I'm cautiously optimistic. It's a good step forward. If I may. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, uh, okay. Scott Jellison. So and in addition to that, as we've already reported, I have met um, uh, with, with, with uh, my construction staff and the contractor a couple of times. I reported that to you. We were trying to resolve this at a, uh, at a technical level. Um, and what the last meeting, which was in December, uh, or maybe it was even November, we had agreed as, as two parties, we had agreed that we would allow the geotech engineers, because this is a geotech problem, this is a geotech technical issue. We agreed we would let the geotech engineers sit down in a room and try and come to some kind of a um, agreement or resolution as to what was actually found 200 feet below grade in terms of the, act, the amount of water that they felt was above and beyond the, the scope of their, their bid. So we, it was postponed at least twice. We have it it's scheduled, it is scheduled for the 23rd. Uh, our pre, my pre-meeting is the 23rd and the, the, the other meeting is the 24th. Fifth, I think, which is two days later. So we are working in both arenas. Um, mediation, we're also working, trying to resolve it directly with the contractor, and we'll give you an update as, after that meeting. So this is into the merits of the issue? The, yes. It, from yes. a technical standpoint. Yes, and we've already given our position on that, but um, we've, we've been very open and told the contractor, if you can prove to us that there's something as we would call it in construction, unforeseen conditions, which is more water than they expected. We've talked about this numerous times during the design and the construction and the bidding. The biggest liability in any tunnel project 200 feet down is water. And um, they have to prove to us that they experienced more water than, than our geotech boring information Provided. It, it's really the issue. Th this is significant in the sense that they had agreed to do it before and then never did it. So if they show up, it'll be significant. Yeah, so we're, 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 we're scheduled a meeting scheduled for the right. 25th of January and uh, go from there. Commissioner? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, through you, I, I guess. Commissioner my, Taylor. I guess my question is basically <coughs> what's our exposure here? If any, I mean, what are the parameters that we're dealing with within this particular context? You know, people are talking about having discussions and you know, mediation, but I mean, can we get as commissioners some idea of what our exposure is? Because um, I think that that's important for people to have an idea. Uh, 
because you can you can agree to any number of things, but within the Chris. context of this situation, uh, at the end of the day, we're talking about dollars, money. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and District um, Council. Uh, Chris Stone, District Council. Um, I can tell you what pub the public information about our exposure, i.e., the complaint filed in the federal court asked for a minimum da in damages of thirty-seven million dollars, um, and that has to do with the uh, claim of a differing site condition within Reach One. The, the tunnel itself is divided up into three reaches. Three reaches. There is also we expect a claim for Reach Two and Three. Uh, of some unknown amount that, that hasn't been quantified yet, but it, it's this is not insignificant. Now, that's the claim, um, but you, we all know there's two sides to every story, and um, if, if you wanted to get into uh, our side of it and strategies, et cetera, I would yeah, suggest that you either go into executive session now or, or allow the Bureau of Public Works, which has been dealing with this on a, I won't say monthly, but certainly bi-monthly basis through uh, uh, former Chairman uh, Bassino, and I'm sure now through uh, whomever the next chairman is going to be, uh, keeping them apprised of what's going on both through the committee at the committee level, and also uh, independently as chairman uh, of that committee. So, uh, uh, but whatever the pleasure is of the board well, is fine uh, with me. My my recommendation that we do go into an executive session. We have a substantial number of commissioners here that exceed the number of commissioners we would have at at the uh, Committee on Public Works. If, if I may share. I'm sorry, we, we Chief did, Executive. Yeah, th th thank you. We, we did give a, a full update on the <coughs> issue at BPW, uh, whatever the date Mr. was. Chairman. I don't remember the actual date, but, but thank you. But we did but we did get a, a full update uh, on this topic uh, to BPW, and I believe we did go into an executive session on that, on that, uh, on that claim issue. So. Commissioner Patel. Yes, I, I agree with the strategy. We should not be discussing this right now, and it should be very confidential, because this is all here. Our estimate, no, don't, don't project, so that they can estimate about how much we are ready to pay. So stay out of it. Thank you. Staff has done a good job. They will document, and then we will have continue our resource available to assess what we need to do. Thank you. Is there anyone that wishes an executive an executive session to discuss this? How how much time would are you talking about, Chris? This is this is really just the beginning. The case was just filed in uh, very late 2022, so we're just in the, the really the early stages of um, of the the uh, battle, so to speak. So. I, I think the, the better, better course would be uh, allow us to get a schedule for the actual mediation conference. There's a scheduling conference yeah, next uh, Tuesday. I could submit. Day. That's not confidential. That's a public record of the court, so I can send each of you an email alerting you as to the timing of, of how it's going to proceed. And then has each mediation uh, session either takes place uh, prior to or just shortly thereafter report back to whatever board the chairman decides, whether it be the full board or, or continue with the Bureau of Public Works, that we do that. And then um, along the way, as we report to Bureau of Public Works, then give an update to the board as well. Yeah, we could give an update at that time to the board at, uh, at a future meeting. Any objection to that? No, sorry. Okay. Further questions of the executive chief executive's report? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Mr. Commissioner Chair. Commissioner Mayendai. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, District Council, I'm just wondering, I know in 2022 we passed a conflict of interest statement, and I'm just wondering when we should be doing that, signing that, when it will be ready for the commissioners to go through or how that's going to work. Well, I, be I believe that, it, and, and I could be correct me if I'm wrong, please. But I, I think the the form is the form is finalized, and I think it's been distributed. If it hasn't, then I'll make Not sure yet. it gets I'll make sure it gets distributed immediately. I know that Steve was Steve and my Steve Bonafonte in my office was working on that, and unfortunately, he's away this week on on on, uh, on family stuff. So, uh, but uh, we'll take care of that. And then I know that he has ex um, done some uh, research on um, either through. Uh, internet um, and, and 
professional organizations to do a primer on conflict of interest that I think would be helpful for everybody, including me, um, in, in, in my office. So that so we're working on that. If we're unsuccessful, we'll do it ourselves. And, and we have had communications with the state uh, Office of State Ethics, and they've expressed a willingness to come down and visit with us in person on uh, either one or two sessions divided up between the commissioners to to have that primer on, on ethics. But we will be able to do that in short order and certainly before the January 31st deadline of when those have right. to be that, that That was articulated in the adoption that it would be done in the month of January. So it's early in January. We're moving along on it. Thank you. Further questions of the Chief Executive Officer? Okay. Um, boy, that was a short one yep. for you. Uh, right. Uh, nine, committee on organization consideration and potential action regarding appointment of commissioners to committees. Recommended action, receive the report and adopt the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. um, the, the resolution before you is uh, slightly amended at organization. Um, the appointments listed to the Committee on Government, um, Commissioner Desai uh, is appointed to government, but Bazano and Gale um, are not being recommended. Do you want to keep 10 minutes? Uh, I, can, I can wait. Uh, keep my Commissioners um, Bazano and Gale are um, not being recommended to be appointed to government, but instead uh, to strategic planning. And then also the two commissioners. They're, they're on, on the copy okay. that they had. Okay. Is there discussion? If not, all of you, so we've covered all of the amendments and everything else that were, okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, committee on MDC government consideration and potential action re regarding appointment of legislative consultants. Uh, recommended action, receive the report and adopt a resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there an amendment? Uh, there, there was an amendment approved at government <coughs> to modify the, um, the compensation amounts. For Gaffney and Bennett, it was increased to, um, this is only on the state level. You'll see in the resolution, the fir uh, first paragraph is state lobbyists and the second paragraph is federal. Uh, for the state lobbyists, for Gaffney and Bennett, the uh, amendment was increased to 69,000 from 60,000. Um, SJB was from 20,000 to 25,000, and um, strategic outreach was increased <laughs> from 60,000 to 66,000. Okay. Other questions? Why are we increasing? Um, we should Chris. Yeah, if I might, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chris Stone, District Council. Um, uh, the, th the three lobbyists at the state level have been our lobbyists at the state level, uh, Brendan, for a decade plus, um, uh, Steve for four or five years, and uh, Janice Fleming for at least three years now, maybe four. But in each of them have done an exemplary job. And uh, we, we felt that uh, there's been a significant period of time, um, four years, that there was no increase for um, Either the, either it's the first change of four years, then, as far as it's about. It, it may be three years, Commission. It's right. been it's been a while, and one of the reasons why it hasn't happened before is because of uh, in, you know I hate to blame everything on COVID, but in fact COVID shut down the Capitol for at least two 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 and a half years, and the work that had to be done, uh, where one time you, you had to be at the Capitol and wait around and wait around, you know, was done telephonically uh, through Zoom, etc., Zoom meetings. And I won't say it was any um, easier substantively, but at least practically it was easier to do it that way than, than to be at the Capitol trying to hunt people down. So um, we did not increase them during that period of time. And there wasn't a necessarily a, uh, a direct request from any one of the three uh, for a particular amount of money. They just asked, would we consider it? And um, I, I met with the chairman 
we arrived at, at numbers that uh, to us made sense, but it's obviously it's up to this board to uh, consider it and approve it. Uh, they all do really good work. It's good to have a, a, a consistency at the Capitol with, with who's representing you so they know that when Brendan's there representing the NBC, he's a longstanding NBC lobbyist. He knows what he's talking about. He can be trusted. And likewise for both Steve and, and Janice, the same. Um, I use Brendan only as an example. Uh, they're, all, they're all trusted up there at the, at the Capitol and, and all do really hard work for us. So um, we're asking for what I consider to be, uh, particularly in light of what's happened over the past two or three years, and no increase, a modest increase. Uh, we can do that within your existing board budget. We don't have to um, uh, add money to the budget that you just approved for 2023. Um, and I, I truly think it's money well spent. Further discussion? Commissioner, Commissioner Lewis. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, while we're voting on the lobbyist contracts, I just want to acknowledge the work that Janice Fleming Butler did over the summer. Um, she is a friend of mine, and I am also a member of the Voices of Women of Color. Um, but she held six house parties over the summer. And at these house parties, she invited organizations and residents of our membership towns for the purpose of updating them on what she did during the session and to answer some really tough questions that the community has um, regarding MDC. She had everyone sign in. It was an amazing time. We even had um, Scott at the last one we had and he heard from our consumers and gained the support of the people that was at the party. Um, and they are also going to join Janice in advocacy at the LOB when needed. So I just wanted to put that on the record. I'm super proud of her, and um, I just wanted you to know how firsthand how serious she takes this opportunity. Um, thank you. If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, Okay, uh, now item, we've got to go back to uh, a, an agenda item, Adam Add. Um, I'm going to let John uh, explain what, what happened and what we failed to do, and we're resolving how we resolved it. Yeah, um, if, if somebody could make a motion to amend the agenda. Uh, every January, uh, I report as a district clerk uh, service of the tax warrants on the member towns. Um, and it's just basically notifying you that the tax warrants were served and received. So if somebody can make a motion to amend the agenda with a two-thirds vote, I'll just deliver that report. Mr. So chairman. To, uh, add an addendum to second the agenda. It. Second. It, it's moved and seconded. Uh, is there objection? With no objection, it's before us. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, service of tax warrants for fiscal year 2023. Pursuant to the charter of the district, section 3-13, the district clerk reports the tax warrants for fiscal year 2023 drawn by the chairman of the Metropolitan District in favor of the treasurer have been served on the following. Town clerk Marguerite Phillips Bloomfield, town clerk Robert Pasek East Hartford, town and city clerk Noel McGregor Hartford, town clerk James Krupiansky Newington, town clerk Sandra Merrill Wieliba uh, Rocky Hill, town clerk Essie Lebro West Hartford, Hartford, Town Clerk Sue Schroeder Weathersfield, Town Clerk Anna Posniak Windsor. Receipts for these tax warrants have been received and are on file in the office of the district clerk. Respectfully submitted, John Myrtle. Okay. And no action there's, is necessary. No action. It's been received by the board. No action necessary. It's a housekeeping issue to, to, that we moved on. Um, before I go any further, just because we're dealing, uh, we sh I should have pointed this out in the committee and organization. Uh, there's a document that we have on hand that basically lays out um, the uh, commissioners, uh, committee assignments, names of commissioners, terms of uh, term of expiration uh, and service, their cell numbers and residential phone numbers. It's a public document. It also uh, deals with the appointees who appoints the specific commissioners here by town, by legislature, <coughs> and by, uh, um, by gubernatorial appointment. Uh, it's, it's always been a lot smaller. We've sort of, I guess if age has some effect on this, we've made it a lot larger. It's easier to follow because of the amount of detail that's, that's put on here. Uh, Jackie, you also had some add-ons to it. 
just the amendments to this. Just yeah, I spoke with Mr. Myrtle about it, and he said it would be easy. Yeah, just explain what they. Oh, all we wanted to do was, uh, sorry, Commissioner Van Dyke, at the bottom of um, the sheet. Sorry, Avery. Right down here. Um, right down at the bottom, we um, know how much the quorum is, and I just asked down at the bottom that we also, some of our committees have specific numbers that we cannot exceed according to our charter or our bylaws, and I ask that that be noted so then we know how many people we can only have on the committee. Some are, doesn't matter, and some do, so... Um, Mr. Myrtle said that that would be an easy ad for him on okay. the Okay, that's, that's from an, everybody will get copies of this and you can access it. It changes with people leaving and coming on and we update it on a, day, a weekly basis, I think, or as needed basis. Um, that's it then. Um, Scott, you missed this time. Um, opportunity to general public comments. Well, I had a bet. <laughs> he delayed, 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 so I'd lose. Uh, <laughs> opportunity for general public comments. You actually behave yourself today. Uh, commissioners' questions and comments. Other business? Mr. Chair. Uh, John. Uh, Commissioner Abadesian. Yes, Commissioner Abadesian to uh, the chair to district council. Uh, just so I understand, because I'm... <clears throat> A little vague on this. Uh, today, one of our commissioners, Mr. Mendick, um, had to explain the reason for an abstention. Uh, now, I look through Robert's rules, I don't see anything, but does that mean now that anybody that does that has to explain it, or is that something that is just uh, was asked for uh, and not necessarily uh, required? Uh, Chris Stone, uh, District Council, and as set forth in the um, memorandum that I sent out regarding recusal not too long ago, it's not something that's required. It hasn't been required by the district, and most recently we've had two recusals in which I, I believe one was explained, one, one reason was not explained. It's solely up to the individual commissioner, and I, th I believe, and in, in Commissioner May, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, is that she uh, did so at the request of commissioner and she honored that request yeah that was prior to the ruling that you put out on the uh, Jackie it was prior to the well well her her, her recusing her, herself her recusing prior. herself but, but her explanation tonight was after the right. memo yeah. Yeah. yeah okay thank thank you very much Adam I just wanted to read a statement tonight I want to say that I've known Bill DeBella since I was first elected to the Weathersfield Town Council over 20 years ago. Bill has been in public service long before that. As mayor, I served on a committee led by Bill whose goal was to mediate the differences CRA and MDC were experiencing. Both parties weren't bargaining in good faith, meaning CRA, so that effort failed and it cost us all the district quite a bit. However, I've come to admire his efforts and try to, to end that conflict. Since then, since the beginning, Bill and I have had several other, and several other commissioners have been discussing new technology for both the old CRA plant as well as our own plants. We have discussed methods that works, others that have proven not to work, and technologies that in, work in other parts of the world but haven't been proven yet in the United States. A lot of negativity has surrounded us for several months now. Prior to this, I believe that for the most part, we commissioners have acted in the best interest of this organization. However, for the moment, I don't believe that to be the case. It appears to me that some of us have acted not in the best interest in the organization as a whole. I think that before we continue to make accusations against our fellow commissioners, we should look to the several examples of public service several of us in this room possess. And before people cast aspersions about other, other commissioners' motives, they should remember that we all subscribe to a code of conduct. Our job is to lead, and I think Bill has been an excellent leader. He has tried to spread responsibility for moving this organization forward among us all. Instead of constantly trying to challenge that leadership, we should try to resolve and find new paths forward together. It does us no good to fight among ourselves, so let's dedicate ourselves in 2023 
to finding the best ways to move our organization forward. Thank you. Further comment, questions? Oh, go ahead. Um, Commissioner Curry, I'm sorry. Curry, I'd, I'd like to follow up on uh, the conflict of interest form. Um, and you're right, the state does have a 30-minute a video for ethics. Uh, it's, it's short, uh, depending on how many questions they may get once they present it. But I would suggest that we, we look to that and provide that to our staff and to our commis fellow commissioners and then have them sign off on the form, not, not until they receive uh, some type of formal training. Okay, is that going to be? That's, that's not a problem. Not a problem. Okay. Good point. Further, uh, further <coughs> where are we in questions, uh, comments? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Without objection, we stand adjourned.